I am Jose Muñoz, uh, Global Chief Operating Officer of Hyundai Motor Company, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. Jose, I can't thank you enough for being with me today on the program. What a pleasure. Welcome to Cars and Culture. Well, thank you for having me, Jason. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. You're always on the move, so I should probably start with a simple question. Where are you today? Today, I'm in my beautiful uh, office in um, uh, Fountain Valley in Southern California. Maybe what's more important is where you've been. You just returned from what historically would have been considered the biggest car show in the world. And for those who don't know, every two years, the German auto industry is on display. The IAA dates back to 1897, but it's been in Frankfurt every other year since 1951, a historic auto show. The Porsche 901 was launched there. That's the original 911 in 1963. Legendary global exhibition. The last one that was in Frankfurt was 2019 when auto shows were starting to lose steam. And now two years later, the European car show scene is back. This time though, it moved four hours south by car to Munich. How was, what was it like, Jose, being back at a European car show? Well, it was uh, <clears throat> great for me. You know, it's uh, been uh, probably a, a year and a half uh, since uh, I went to the last uh, uh, car show, right? And it was really beautiful for me to get back to uh, beautiful Munich and then with a gorgeous weather and enjoy the car show, especially when uh, not all OEMs were attending, but our group was uh, present and made a very uh, big and important announcement uh, with the hydrogen wave and then uh, decarbonization. So I, I was really, really very proud to be there. I'm very happy and I will remember forever. There have only been a handful of car shows in the United States this year, Chicago, Denver, even the Detroit Auto Show, remarkably different. What's different about auto shows right now? Well, let me tell you uh, <clears throat> that um, uh, one of the key takeaways for me in Munich uh, feedback from uh, some people is that um, uh, people were missing more cars. So I think we're going to realize that the general public and uh, beyond the, uh, let's say, automotive world, they really love cars and the cars are much more than machines. Uh, we are emotionally attached to them. And then, uh, well, what you can see now is that it is coming back and people are paying a lot of attention to the technology, a lot of attention to the future, but also a lot of attention to, to the cars and to the technologies and uh, uh, way more than uh, just the, the image and the design, uh, the technology, the powertrains, uh, the electrification, the future. I think uh, that's what I can see these days in the motor shows. Consumers have missed car shows, haven't they? Well, that's uh, the feedback I get. The consumers yeah. love going to, to the shows and see so many different cars, ask for the technologies. I, <clears throat> I'm really uh, thinking, uh, you know, that um, uh, this pandemic is bringing uh, some uh, kind of uh, advance uh, and forward thinking on some areas, but it's also uh, uh, bringing to a lot of people the value of what we were do, uh, doing before. And I can see that a lot of people want to be present, be in one place and enjoy physically and touch and drive and everything in the cars. That was always the beauty of car shows. I mean, you could, you could gather at a car show with your family. You could spend some time uh, sitting behind the wheel, you know, getting a feel for, for whether you like the vehicle or not. But auto shows kind of got a little bit sideways because there was a confusion over whether the media was interested or whether consumers were interested. But consumers have always been interested, right? I agree. <clears throat> I agree. I, I still believe uh, that that's the case. And, uh, you know, a testament of, of that belief is the fact that uh, uh, Hyundai was present uh, in the show. And we had a huge uh, uh, presence and we had a lot of visitors. And we actually had also a Genesis and we allowed for test drive. So I, I really believe so. <clears throat> also, as a car enthusiast, I really love going to the shows. And the part that I like the most is when we finish the official program and then I can just go uh, kind of uh, with the crowd and visit uh, uh, every competitor and see what they're thinking and then the, the new trends, etc. The Los Angeles Auto Show is coming up in a couple of months. Hyundai's backyard, mm -hmm. if you will. Yes. What do, you, what do you have planned for that? What will consumers see? 
Well, they're going to be very pleased with what they see. I cannot announce uh, uh, yet what we're going to announce um, in the show, uh, Jason, but I really encourage everybody to uh, go and visit. We are going to be there and we're going to make nice announcements uh, and they're going to be real cars and then some uh, technology and a lot of good stuff. Hyundai's always been known for creative marketing. I think of the Super Bowl commercials that were just downright amazing. Um, some of the ones over the last couple of years. Did COVID change the way that you approach marketing and auto shows are by extension, obviously, <clears throat> a marketing venue? Yes, it did. It did. Uh, for many reasons, right? <clears throat> uh, at the beginning of, of the pandemic, uh, it did because, uh, you know, it was all about how can we support uh, the consumer? And then uh, we launched uh, the, the Hyundai uh, Assurance Program to ensure uh, everybody had peace of mind, even if they lost their job during the pandemic. Uh, and also we wanted to share uh, what is what we were doing uh, through the Hyundai Hop on Wheels. So that was the kind of uh, the beginning. Uh, and then it was all about uh, preserving the cash, uh, preserving the operation and ensuring that the dealers were uh, alive. But then soon after we got into uh, this uh, cheap crisis and it's all about uh, how do, do we uh, optimize production, how do we maintain the operation, how do we provide uh, vehicles to our customers and to our dealers. And then it's changed completely the way we do business, but completely. Uh, things that you would do uh, typically once a month or once every two months, now you have to do uh, almost on a daily basis. <clears throat> you know, you get, a, you get some information, hey, we are supposed to get so many chips uh, tomorrow, but then some they, they arrive, some maybe not. And then with what you have, you need to meet with the team and decide what you're going to pro produce, right? So the flexibility and then the uh, simulation and the scenario uh, planning and uh, all this has changed as it has the way the employees uh, are working. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you that at the beginning it was almost unpleasant to have uh, just video conferences with everybody. But then it ended up being very efficient. Uh, we managed to uh, have a very strong operation based on video conferences. So I think we've learned a lot and uh, I'm sure that a lot of uh, things we've learned are going to continue. So, um, but anyway, what it hasn't changed is that people have need to move. And then the consumers are still interested in, in uh, buying uh, motor vehicles and uh, EV vehicles and new technologies. Uh, and then uh, here we are to try to provide the customers with what they want. Hyundai was a little bit of an outlier, uh, survived the chip shortage or has survived the chip shortage a little better than most and had planned ahead. You realized that some markets were recovering uh, when the U.S. was first hit by the pandemic. And then, in fact, South Korea was recovering, so you continued to order some critical components. I've got to think that that kind of um, foresight was something you couldn't have expected, but we're, we're, we're totally happy to be on the other side of that. You fared better than most. I think you're, you're right. Uh, sometimes when you get into a tough situation, uh, you are tempted to uh, react very quickly. And sometimes uh, you don't pay attention to uh, many other factors uh, that you need to pay attention to when you take a big, a big decision. And uh, definitely in, in Hyundai, we look at it. Uh, a global headquarters uh, had been an example on how uh, to handle the, the pandemic as uh, South Korea uh, was one of the leading markets in terms of uh, controlling it. And we saw uh, how the Korean market, but also other Asian markets were recovering. So um, we thought, what if uh, the U.S. market uh, will recover too? So are we sure we want to get rid of um, uh, key components? And we came to the conclusion that it was better for us not to. So <clears throat> uh, we have been hit, uh, I've said it many times, uh, but probably the fact that we uh, did not cut the orders help us be in better shape than others. But I want to give credit also to the way our manufacturing system uh, and uh, our global headquarters have worked in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to managing crisis, flexibility is uh, the king. And then our teams have been extremely flexible. You know, uh, as I said, everybody thinks maybe the chips are the same uh, for all the cars. Well, they are not. And then the chips that, that uh, you get for different components are coming from different suppliers and have different 
uh, features, right? So uh, the moment uh, you have a different supply than what you were planning, you need to immediately adjust your production plan. And then you adjust your production plan, <coughs> you need to adjust all the uh, supply chain and you need to see it coming and you need to be flexible and you need to ensure the people are going to be there uh, to produce uh, the vehicles when you need them. And moving from, uh, Jason, it would be unbelievable, one day we need to visit together our Alabama plant, you, you will be amazed. But one day you think you're going to have a three shift production and you say, hey, I cannot. I'm just going to go for one shift uh, and then you, you carry on with one shift one or two days and then you move into three and then down to two and then uh, whatever it takes <coughs> to maximize the available uh, capacity. So uh, I give credit to uh, the global headquarters and our flexibility uh, to maneuver but we are, we are uh, also suffering. Uh, let's make it very clear. I've been visiting dealers uh, this week in uh, New York both in Long Island and in Brooklyn and then uh, I tell you the first thing you get uh, uh, as you walk into the showroom is uh, when are we going to get more cars? So uh, that's a key, key challenge. You're one of the first global automotive executives that I've had in this program and I think there are probably some consumers out there who don't understand why they can't go and buy a car at the dealership anymore. Is this not going to change the way that American consumers think about how they approach car buying that's actually much more European in its nature. Build Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you, you, said it, uh, you said it right. So what we have seen is that uh, uh, the American consumer was completely different to anybody else in the world in the sense that uh, you get what you want right there, right now. And then you walk out the dealer just driving your new car. Uh, as you know, in other markets, namely in Europe, that's not the name of the game. So the European consumer wants to uh, order exactly what they want. And even if they, there is a car exactly with the same configuration that they want at the showroom, they want just one fresh coming out of the oven, out of the plant. Well, what we've seen is that the, the American consumer is changing their behavior and then they're visiting the showrooms and they're saying, hey, I like this and they, they take it if, if they, they've got what they want. However, if they don't, they rather wait a few weeks or months to get what they want. Uh, and this is the uh, very well-known so-called build to order. <coughs> we are already uh, working in that mode. I believe that all our competitors are doing it the same, the same way. And it's uh, a, particularly for the dealer, it's a change in the mindset because they look at their objective for the month. Hey, this is what we want to do. However, this is what we got, and maybe half or less. So what is going to happen? So they need to trust. They're going to continue to get cars coming in uh, that they will be able to, to deliver. And then, uh, then the system needs to be accurate enough so that uh, we are able to provide an ETA to the consumer and to the dealer and then constantly discussing and, and, and having communication with the consumer to change uh, those, uh, those dates because change all the time depending on, on the manufacturing schedule. So, but, uh, but again, to your point, <clears throat> I think the American consumer is changing their behavior based on the situation. Your automotive background is hugely varied. And we just mentioned Europe a moment ago. So I want to focus on this for a moment because not many might know that you were a boy, you were a boy who grew up in Madrid. You were also uh, a boy who was a who was studying to be a nuclear scientist, <laughs> which in and of itself is, is, um, is, is not typical for the automotive industry. Why a nuclear science, Jose? Well, uh, <clears throat> this is really what I, I liked and what I keep liking is energy. Uh, and at the time, uh, I wanted to know about energy and I, be, I became an engineer in, uh, in nuclear energy, uh, but also uh, uh, understanding and learning a lot about uh, renewable energy, so solar and wind uh, in particular. So, and I uh, started to work in a, a company, in an a electric company, power generation company in nuclear power plants. <clears throat> and I was really uh, learning a lot uh, and enjoying my, my job uh, with different technologies, both American uh, technologies and also some uh, German technology at the time. It was really, really uh, cool. Um, except that um, uh, you will remember that uh, by the time I graduated, uh, there was a big accident in uh, Chernobyl mm -hmm. in Russia. 
that changed uh, the, the paradigm uh, related to the, the way the world saw the nuclear energy. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> a lot of countries decided that they were going to uh, phase out that energy uh, because of the risk. Uh, and I'm not going to enter into the technicalities of what happened and didn't happen, etc., because the, the technologies uh, are very, very different than the one uh, that had the accident in Russia. But uh, my country, uh, Spain, being one of the largest producers of natural uranium, believe it or not, well decided to uh, stop the development uh, of this te technology. And then I uh, was uh, happy enough to um, uh, phase into aerospace within the same company, <coughs> also uh, working for European space uh, programs. So always uh, I was uh, uh, doing very complex, very technical, very scientific things. And guess what? Uh, when you work in, in uh, aerospace, you realize that there is no uh, possible change on the SOP or SOS, which uh, for those who are not familiar with is uh, very well known in the industry, in the automotive industry is the start of production or the start of sales. So when you're going to launch a rocket uh, uh, with satellites and a lot of very expensive components, you uh, have to determine exactly the time you, you, do, uh, you do that and you cannot change it. So you need to work harder 24-7, uh, whatever it takes to make it on, on time. So you have to do it. And due to that, <clears throat> I had to very frequently stay in, in my office till late uh, trying to finalize calculations. And I, I realized that I needed a car uh, rather than commuting uh, by train uh, back and forth. Uh, and this is how uh, I, uh, by almost accident, uh, I get into this industry. Well, I want to I want to get to Julia in a moment, but uh, <laughs> but I want to I want to also talk about about that aerospace piece. Your father was a military figure. Mm -hmm. Your mother ran the household, but your father really believed in the military, as did you. Character, resilience, rigor, honesty sacrifice, honor. Those are all things that you really believed in growing up, right? And I continue to believe in, yes, <clears throat> absolutely, and sacrifice, and then doing the right thing always, which has been uh, also helpful uh, during tough times, not only with the family, but also in business, absolutely. And uh, in our industry, <clears throat> these are values, which I recommend to uh, all the newcomers, uh, because they help you no matter what. You worked for NATO for a while, and in fact, the U.S. Embassy when you lived in Brussels, right? <laughs> well, a, a lot of a lot of uh, things, but uh, sometimes directly, sometimes in, indirectly. Um, I was um, based in uh, in uh, Brussels in the headquarters of another manufacturer uh, that was by by NATO, and I had a lot of uh, uh, very good uh, contacts and, and a lot of um, good friends uh, who were stationed uh, there and uh, taking my kids to the same school as, uh, as they were taking them. So, which was uh, a very big opportunity and, and the first time that I got exposed very widely to America. And uh, uh, that was a really great moment uh, in my career and as a development of, uh, of the family and the personality, yes. So let's go back to the aerospace engineer who's in his 20s working day and night and you got <laughs> tired of taking the train late at night. You're left stranded some nights, right? So let's get to the car story. You had a friend who recommended where <laughs> you should go to buy the car, your first car, because you'd never purchased a car. And so where did you go? Well, <clears throat> my friend told me, you know, uh, I'm gonna introduce you uh, the best. Uh, he didn't say car dealer, but he said uh, a sales manager. Um, and then uh, I followed his, his advice and then I ended up in, in this uh, car dealer in, uh, in Madrid and the sales manager uh, was the one uh, who took care of me. And then, uh, well, I'll make the long story short, but uh, she, she was the, <clears throat> the, the daughter of the owner and then uh, I married her. Uh, so that was a, a great uh, way to enter into the automotive uh, industry because by dating her, I realized uh, how interesting this industry was. Uh, which had a lot of engineering, uh, a lot of planning, uh, a lot of uh, manufacturing, uh, distribution, uh, the dealer business, uh, and of course the consumer, uh, the, um, the attention to detail, the, the customer satisfaction, so many ingredients, so complex, <coughs> uh, which I, I really uh, liked. 
and then by um, uh, trying to support uh, my wife's business uh, at the time, uh, I had the opportunity to learn. I was working, I, I continued to work in my previous job, but I had, uh, I spent some time uh, working at the dealer, learning and trying to sell cars and understanding the consumer. You know, till today, Jason, one of uh, the key, uh, uh, I would say humbly success factors, or at least factors that have helped me in, in my career, uh, is the fact that I understand the way the dealers think. And I, I think uh, uh, I also understood how important uh, the customers are and how important uh, delivering what the customers want is. Sometimes, you know, you would have a green car <coughs> uh, and then the customer wanted a red one. And you try to solve him the, the green car because it's what you wanted, what you had, right? And then uh, you would always end up having uh, that customer coming back some time later saying that, you know, he wanted the red. And then you learn very soon that you need to provide the customer what they want. So anyway, that was a great opportunity for me uh, to ap appreciate uh, uh, how relevant this, this uh, business and, and uh, how important this industry was. And then I decided to uh, give it a try. Uh, and then, hey, I'm very happy and I hope I will retire in this industry. So you spent almost six or seven years working in that dealership, right? Or in and yes. around the dealership? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is the nuclear scientist who was the aerospace engineer who all of a sudden was helping people buy the green car or the red car. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, or this model or the other one <clears throat> or the different models here yeah, yeah, is very, very difficult. A very, a very different business for you. And then you go over to the other side. You go to the factory side and you spend three years at Daewoo in Iberia, five years at Toyota, 15 at Nissan, including Mexico, and a series of roles that took you all the way to nearly the top of the organization. What an incredible journey. Absolutely. And every single step, it was a very important one uh, to get to where I am uh, right now. And uh, I believe now I'm in, in the best company and in the best uh, position and in the best uh, uh, location to have an impact uh, in the industry. But it's been really an um, important journey. I mean, it's the, it's the story of, uh, of our lives, right? And then everything that uh, goes with it, including your family uh, and your colleagues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Did you think you would eventually run Nissan one day? Yes. Yes, I thought so. I, I thought so. It didn't, it didn't happen. <clears throat> so I'm now uh, in a great company in, uh, in Hyundai. And then I see a lot of potential. I like a lot the philosophy of the company. Uh, I like uh, very much the direction by our chairman. Uh, and then I get along very well with the uh, president and the CEO and the members of the team. Uh, they give me a lot of opportunity to develop the business. And uh, you know, uh, when you are long enough in, in the industry, uh, you ap appreciate, you learn to appreciate when things go well. And I got to say that even though uh, there have been really very challenging times uh, in the industry for everybody, <clears throat> the business uh, has been very, very solid. Uh, we've been able to uh, maintain our launching plans. Uh, we are uh, really bringing to the consumer great new technologies. And then the sales are going well. The dealers are uh, selling more cars. They're making more money. The brand is, is going well. I have a really fantastic team uh, and then we have a lot of a, a very good direction from the global headquarters. So I'm, I'm really uh, pleased, you know, uh, sometimes uh, you don't know how and uh, you get into cert certain places. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm very, very pleased and I'm very, very happy to, to be here and doing what I'm doing. Well, in fact, you wouldn't be the global CEO at Hyundai had it not been for the incident that occurred with Renault Nissan boss Carlos Ghosn. And I know you were you were very close with him. Um, you you worked very close with him. And uh, of course, um, for those listeners who don't know, he he made headlines when he was he was arrested uh, a few years ago in uh, Japan and escaped from house arrest and went to Lebanon while being hidden in a music box. Um, a, a fascinating story. But I, I want to know from you your relationship with him. What was he like to work with? Well, <clears throat> uh, I've uh, had a very uh, strong uh, professional uh, relationship. So uh, Mr. Goh was a top executive uh, who was really focused on the business. And then uh, he was someone very, very smart, hardworking, uh, with a lot of uh, views about uh, the company, about the future, about the industry. 
a, and I've learned a lot and I respect him a lot for everything that, uh, that he's done uh, professionally, right? So, and I, I will stop it there. But what I can tell you is that a lot of um, <clears throat> the learnings uh, can be exported to many other uh, areas of the business and many other uh, companies. And then uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't skip any bit of what I've learned uh, working for him. You've worked in so many different cultures, and there's a lot that's been written in the last couple of years about different business cultures and how they handle decision makers. Um, one, one could include Mr. Gone in that, in that mix. Is business culture underestimated too often or the differences in business culture underestimated? I think they are, uh, Jason. And then um, one of the things uh, you learn when you are a kind of an international a citizen, if you like, <clears throat> uh, and then you work for global uh, corporations, when you are not uh, the, <clears throat> the majority or the, or the main nationality, uh, there you, you have to adjust yourself. You have to learn a lot. You have to be uh, very open-minded. You have to be patient, uh, but also you need to uh, uh, ensure you understand how to get things done in different environments. I can tell you, uh, uh, even uh, uh, you mentioned working for two different Japanese companies, uh, the Japanese, but they're different, uh, right? And the cultures were different and the management was different and the governance was different, but you still had to uh, get things done and, had, and have an impact. So to me, one, one of the things uh, that uh, drives me is the results. I always tell the team that uh, most important uh, in developing my career is being the PR. And when people say, oh, so it's a uh, public relations. I said, no, it's the power of results. That's mm -hmm. what drives the career, right? <clears throat> and then uh, you need to understand how to get things done. And then uh, it comes uh, with uh, being able to capitalize on your team uh, and then uh, embracing uh, different cultures and ensuring that all the resources that you have are working together to one end. Uh, Hyundai has been the great uh, experience uh, to that end because it's such a great big company with so many different entities that uh, uh, the power is there, but you need to put it all, all together. And then I call it the collective success uh, where everybody is proud uh, uh, to deliver the results that the company uh, is delivering. But it's, uh, <clears throat> it cannot be a culture of uh, finger pointing. It's a culture of determining the direction, working all together, have common objectives, and uh, embrace uh, different ways to work uh, with a common end, which is the results for the company. In fact, Hyundai has been on a transformative path. And your responsibilities include not only the global operations and strategies, but the regions, the Americas, North, Central, South America. And you sleep when, Jose? When do you sleep <laughs> with all of that responsibility? <laughs> I, I, I sleep every day, I tell you. <clears throat> but uh, I, I sleep fast. That's, all, that's also a characteristic. And then, thanks God, I got a nature which allows me, when I have more to do and the highest pressure, for some reasons, I have the, the uh, best efficiency in resting. And what I can tell you is that the biggest challenge when you run a global operation is not to rest a uh, little, is uh, the time change. So then uh, you end up <clears throat> having to go to sleep when maybe you are not tired, and then you have to keep going uh, when you are very tired. And then uh, this can only be done when you are really focused, uh, and then it's, uh, it's driven by your motivation, is again the, the PR. So, but uh, I sleep every day. Well, <laughs> It's it's ironic, right? Because as a boy, you wanted to be a pilot. You now you've ended up logging more miles than most pilots. In truth, absolutely <laughs> sure. So let's talk about your mission, and and I want to get back to Hyundai and its and and how it's changed so much in the U.S. And I don't have to tell you about the perception change that's occurred when it first began selling cars in America in February of 1986. There was one vehicle, the Excel, and there was a huge success. And that year, actually. Hyundai set a record of selling the most automobiles in its first year of business in the U.S. compared to any other car brand. It was on fire, but then it had some quality issues. What was your impression of Hyundai while you were at Nissan? Well, 
I always saw Hyundai as a great company, always. <coughs> uh, you, you mentioned that um, uh, I was um, having the opportunity to experience Korea very early in my career. <coughs> and I was completely blown away when I visited uh, Korea <coughs> and when I worked with the Koreans because they are really very thorough, they, they are very bold, uh, and they're very passionate, and they want to be the best, right? <clears throat> so from the very beginning, uh, when I visited Korea, I said, wow, what is Hyundai? I was very curious. Any, anyone who has not visited Korea, I, I kindly invite them to visit, and they will realize uh, who Hyundai is, right? So it was really uh, such a huge impression uh, on, on me. Uh, and then the fact that it's a child and then the impact of the family and, and how the different components of, of, the, of the company are built. So I've always been very respectful and I always thought, always, that uh, Hyundai is like a big uh, sleeping lion uh, that one day was going to wake up I was going to make a big stance uh, globally. <clears throat> and I think that now uh, with the, our chairman, the lion is completely awake <clears throat> and is uh, really ready to go. So uh, that was my impression. So always very respectful and now very, very honored and very impressed when I see it uh, from within. And including enormous investments in America and the design center that was built in 1990, the investments in Alabama and California, in Michigan, and the products that have been expanded now. You look at Sonata, Veloster, Santa Fe, Palisade, now even a pickup truck, Jose. And then that's not even including what's been done at Genesis. Hyundai's on a roll, right? Yes, it is, uh, Jason. So I think uh, the, um, the chairman has decided the direction of the company. Right, and, if, and he's decided to invest about $50 billion on new technologies and product development, <clears throat> and there is no compromise. And even during the pandemic, uh, we continue to deliver on our promise. You know that through the pandemic, we localized the Tucson. Uh, we just launched uh, the uh, Santa Cruz, and uh, uh, we made the announcement uh, of the $7.4 billion investment in the different brands of the group, in, in Hyundai, Genesis, Kia, and the different uh, business units. And we just uh, keep delivering, and there is uh, no, no mercy. <clears throat> so the plan is the plan, we, de we deliver on the plan, and we can see uh, the benefits. You know, to me, one of the uh, uh, biggest commitments uh, has been uh, the electrification, how a company has decided that uh, is going to be leading <clears throat> in the era of electrification and made commitments to uh, deliver 1 million uh, uh, EVs by 2025 and take 8 to 10 percent share by uh, 2040 of this market and started to launch hybrids, plug-in hybrids uh, and EV and then about to launch a, a sub-brand uh, so-called Ionic with the first uh, a car uh, so-called Ionic 5. And not, not uh, happy enough with this, we've uh, come and made an agreement with uh, Aptive uh, and mo Motional in order to have this car be a driverless car uh, to do a robot taxi uh, starting in 2023. And then I could go on and on and on if I mention, <clears throat> you know, Genesis, no SUVs uh, till very recently. And then we launched <clears throat> uh, the GV80, a big success in the market. Uh, recently, the GV70, big success. So we are selling three times uh, what we were selling uh, just a year ago, almost, almost every month when some are having some issues in, in the market. So, I mean, the plan is unbelievable. Uh, the company is on, on a roll. And then uh, I would say just wait and see what is going to happen with the hydrogen. I don't want to just uh, uh, take all, all the time, but uh, this is just the beginning. Well, in fact, you're actually kind of going back to your roots, right? Because if you talk about the, you know, <laughs> the nuclear scientist is now going to be dealing with hydrogen, um, just announced recently, um, Hyundai Motor Group Chairman E.S. Chung's the hydrogen wave that you talked about. He talked about it was talked about during the uh, Munich Auto Show. By 2030, price parity with full electric vehicles, and by 2040, full hydrogen deployment. These are ambitious goals. These are really ambitious go goals. But I want you to know that um, <clears throat> uh, those goals are really uh, very grounded and uh, founded on a very concrete uh, objectives. So for, for example, uh, the, the intention is to reduce 
uh, the cost uh, of the hydrogen systems by 50%, reduce the volume uh, of these systems by 30%, and double the output at the same time. <clears throat> so it's not, it's not like we don't know how to get there, there is a very clear plan. And then, uh, well, <clears throat> you know the benefits and then, and then you're right. When you work in aerospace, you work with uh, uh, very interesting technologies, including uh, liquid nit nitrogen and others. At the end of the day, uh, the hydrogen uh, systems are simpler. They can provide a better uh, range for the consumer. And in particular, for heavy duty uh, truck applications, nobody uh, uh, argues that this is probably the best. In fact, uh, we've launched, uh, as you know, a pilot program in Switzerland, uh, Exient, which now we are exporting uh, globally. Uh, and then uh, we just uh, got awarded recently by the California government a project where we're going to introduce uh, this technology in heavy duty trucks here in, in California. And then based on the announcement by the chairman, uh, we want to apply this technology uh, to everything, uh, everywhere, and for everybody, right? So we want to make it a mass technology, which is what you need. When you think about it, uh, and then uh, if we were having this discussion 12 to 15 years ago, that was the conversation about EV. And there were very, very <coughs> uh, many people reluctant about the EV. And we don't have a charging infrastructure, the cost is too high, the range is too low, the cost is too high, and you, you name it. The exact same movie uh, that, that we've seen is happening with the, with the hydrogen, except that this technology uh, it is bringing even more value to the consumer. So we see, as you know, uh, that in order to uh, get to the entire journey <clears throat> and really be able to uh, be 100% uh, respectful with the, uh, with the uh, atmosphere, the hydrogen technology is the very best. What a better technology than one that produces water as a byproduct, you know, this is fantastic and we really uh, want to get it done. I'm sure there are many listeners out there thinking, well, I don't have a hydrogen station that's around the corner from me. So when's, how, how do those worlds come together? Well, <clears throat> they are not today, but uh, 15 years ago, there were not uh, EV chargers. Uh, so there are many players uh, in the industry and the so-called uh, hydrogen ecosystem it is not only about the technology, uh, but also it's about the infrastructure. So we are definitely very happy uh, to have seen President Biden launching uh, his infrastructure bill and all the initiatives, including uh, the hydrogen. And then my, my vision is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this hydrogen technology is not so complex. There are several countries in Europe which have already uh, tested successfully uh, the the a transformation from a, a normal gas into hydrogen infrastructure as a pilot that is not so complex. And if you look at it, uh, you know, it all depends on uh, the, the pressure that you need to uh, transport the, the hydrogen, right? And then in many countries uh, in Europe, for example, natural gas is utilized and is utilized with uh, uh, systems and pipelines which need uh, <coughs> 350 bars. Well, this is something that is already utilized for many years. We could utilize this type of infrastructure as well for, for hydrogen. So my, my view is that in the future, a lot of the uh, uh, current petrol stations, uh, gas stations, are going to be transformed into hydrogen stations. And then the consumer will have same peace of mind uh, and will be able to utilize the, this technology uh, with the same confidence <clears throat> and with the less uh, range anxiety than the one that they are experiencing today with an EV. This automotive business is so ever-changing. It's been, it, it's a long way from where it was when you were the Citroën dealer in, uh, in Spain. If I'm a casual automotive person, and if I'm, if I'm a business leader though, what am I looking at? when I examine how the auto industry is going to change over the next 10 years. How do you see it changing? <clears throat> well, the industry is, is changing from, uh, you know, just uh, providing, designing and producing uh, vehicles, objects, <clears throat> into uh, becoming uh, what we call a, a smart mobility a solution provider, <clears throat> which comprises not only uh, those vehicles, 
but the technology, the systems, the applications that come uh, with it. So the way I see it, uh, it is uh, similar to the evolution of TV. Uh, I, I mentioned this example uh, many, many times. When I was a kid, I could only see TV certain hours in the day and I only had access to two channels. <clears throat> and the programs were the programs for everybody. Then uh, we enter into the cable TV and then we have many options. Nowadays, uh, with uh, Netflix and uh, other many uh, channels and technologies, <clears throat> you have a TV a la carte, right? So you decide what you see, when you see it, how you see it, uh, the device that you see it on, etc. So mobility, from my point of view, is evolving in the same way. I see in the future you may have uh, a car uh, that you want to have in your garage, uh, but you may have another car uh, when you travel for business to the city that you travel to on a regular basis. But when you go on vacation, you may have a ride and then you may get uh, all those available already in your menu of options, right? So I see a much more uh, <clears throat> user-friendly, uh, lower cost for the consumer. But at the end of the day, uh, one thing that we've learned through the pandemic is that we want to be with those we love, with our friends, with our family. And then uh, mobility is going to be a key a, a element when it comes to the, the progress for humanity. And that's why in our company uh, we say uh, that our strategy is about progress for humanity. And the hydrogen is part of that uh, promise to the consumer. Jose, just a few more items. You've had such a fascinating career in so many different places around the world. But I understand you became a country music fan when you moved to Nashville. <laughs> Luke Bryan, Reba McIntyre, you even brought Keith Urban in for a dealer meeting at one point. And I know you were already a music fan because you played the guitar in a high school band in Madrid called Sal de Mi Vida, which <laughs> for those who don't know, is has a double meaning, right? It means get out of my life or you are the salt of my life. Exactly. <laughs> so being in America now for so long and living in California now, I'm guessing you get the chance to see some of your favorite bands. I do, I do. And then you got it, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, when I was in, in Nashville, I enjoyed, you, ha you have uh, to enjoy what you have around you. I, lear I learned that uh, from my very uh, first international experience, because you always miss your family, you miss your weather, you miss your food, etc. until you change your mindset and then you enjoy what you see around. Uh, you, you enjoy the Belgian beer, or the fromage in, uh, in France, or the wine in France, or the sun in California, and the Pacific Ocean, and then the, the country music in Nashville, absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, I, I have um, a great um, uh, uh, connections uh, in Nashville. I, I love it, and, and in Tennessee in general, it's a great state, it's a great place to do business. And then uh, I have a lot of friends. And then, but now I'm a, I'm a Californian. My only regret is that I'm not a good surfer yet, but I'm, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. And then uh, I want to have a special edition of our Santa Cruz uh, uh, with me so that I can get my, my board and enjoy a little bit. But uh, meanwhile, even though I'm not a good surfer, I'm a good rider in my bike. And there are many, many trails and activities you can do with your bike around. So you have to enjoy. But I've got to say, uh, Jason, you know this, there is probably no better place uh, on earth to live uh, than in California. So uh, I encourage uh, everybody to come here and then enjoy. And some people might not know, you also have a pretty famous friend who just went over to Manchester United, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's yeah. no longer playing for Real Madrid, which probably breaks your heart. <laughs> Yes, it does. But he's a great uh, player. He's got a great uh, uh, mindset and he's a fighter. And, you know, the first uh, game he came back to play uh, with Man United, he strike uh, two goals and he's doing, he's doing great. So that's the, that's the right spirit. Uh, but I'm still a Real Madrid supporter and I can't wait to see Real Madrid winning again the Champions League. Well, we will be watching that. We will be watching you very closely and all of Hyundai's progress and your continued path to make sure that, that the lion is no longer sleeping anymore because I think if anybody watches the automotive world you'll see that Hyundai is definitely alive and well and roaring so Jose Munoz global COO at Hyundai thank you so much for being with me on Cars and Culture it's been a pleasure seeing you again 
Thank you for having me, Jason. I really enjoy and you made me think a lot about uh, my life, my career, my friends. You've been a very, very important one. And then uh, the most important of all is to enjoy what we're doing. So uh, let's enjoy all together and come to Hyundai and to Genesis. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Jose. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.